There's no greater test of your survival skills than a trip to Antarctica. This icy continent, which is larger than the whole of Europe, has temperatures that occasionally reach as low as negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. With winds that often approach 200 miles per hour, this barren, crevice-filled, snowy desert is one of the most unforgiving places on Earth. Why you'd want to go there? <laughs> I don't know, but you've made your choice. Will you be smart enough to survive this trepidatious expedition while keeping your crew alive? Grab your parka and furs and let's find out. Amazing. Wave hello. Picture the scene. You're leading an expedition to Antarctica on a small boat with a six-man crew. While approaching the Antarctic landmass, floating ice severs your boat right in two. Forced out, you and your crew grab the essentials and pile onto the emergency canoe, heading for shore. Suddenly, an enormous chunk of ice falls off a distant glacier, sending a big wave headed perpendicularly toward your canoe. At negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, falling into the water is certain death. What do you command your crew to do? A. Stop paddling and remain perfectly still until the wave passes. B. Keep moving and lean away from the wave when it hits. Or C. Keep moving and lean into the wave when it hits. This is no time to stop moving. Momentum is everything in this situation and stopping would leave you capsized. Leaning away from the wave would make you much more likely to be flipped over, even if you're moving, as the wave would roll you even further in that direction. So leaning into the wave retains some balance, giving you the best chance of avoiding being flipped and dipped. Shipless leadership. You manage to survive the wave without capsizing, but it sends you flying towards the shore and the canoe breaks on the ice. While thankfully dry, you're stranded in the Antarctic wasteland and your chances of survival are incredibly slim. What do you tell your crew? A, be honest with the crew and tell them how serious the situation is. B, tell an obvious lie to the crew that you'll get them through this alive. Or C, offer to pass the leadership on to someone else. Morale is everything in Antarctica in a much more physical way than you might think. The lower you can keep your crew's stress hormones, the less urine their body will produce. This means their risk of dehydration is lower and they'll also lose less heat. Telling them they're basically doomed is going to stress them out and passing leadership on will do the same. But if you lie to them, even if it's obvious, hearing reassuring words of hope from a strong leadership figure can seriously raise morale. And that positivity could be the difference between life and death. Cold sweats. With the crew's spirits raised, you set up a big tent and insulate it with a wall of snow. All this exertion leaves you sweaty, despite the severe cold. In the Antarctic, sweat can quickly freeze and induce frostbite, so how do you deal with it? A, enter the tent with everyone and remove a layer of clothing. B, light a small fire inside the tent. Or C, stand outside and let the wind dry you. Standing outside in the wind will just freeze your sweat, quickening the path to hypothermia and frostbite. And lighting a fire in your tent will not only give you a hefty dose of carbon monoxide, but the temperature change in your tent will be drastic. This could dehydrate you, and a rapid temperature change risks damaging your body's cells and vascular system. Entering the tent together and removing your warmest layer will allow you to share body warmth to evaporate the sweat without endangering your bodies with a drastic temperature change. Careful coziness. Now that you're warmed up and dried off, it's time for some shut-eye. But because everyone's motionless while sleeping, the tent will get much colder. You're decked out in warm clothes, including a thick hooded coat and a balaclava. You have a sleeping bag, but to fend off hypothermia, what's the best way to use it? A. Zipped up over your head. B. Sleep on top of the sleeping bag to put space between you and the ground. Or C. Zip up your sleeping bag, but keep your head out in the colder air. The comfort and additional warmth gained from sleeping on top of your sleeping bag is negligible. As sleeping bags work best for trapping warmth, zipping up inside the bag might seem like the best option, but the moisture in your breath will condense in there while you sleep. 
This will either freeze or at least cool down and dampen the inside of your sleeping bag. Sleeping with your head out will trap the most overall body heat and your balaclava and hood will retain at least some warmth for your head. Chilly Choices When the morning comes, three of your crewmen are complaining about the effects of extreme cold. There's only one extra jacket. It's up to you to decide who needs it the most. A, the man who's shivering uncontrollably. B, the man who seems to be drunk, stumbling around, mumbling about the cold. Or C, the man with big blisters on one of his hands. The shivering man is of least concern. Shivering is in itself an uncontrollable action, and in such temperatures, it's to be expected from almost everyone. The other man's blistered hand is a sign that he's had minor frostbite, and it's rewarmed, causing the formation of the blisters. Seeing as there's no blackness, the worst of the frostbite is probably already over for him. But stumbling and mumbling fall under what Antarctic veterans call the umbles. These signs of deliriousness indicate an advancing state of hypothermia, so get that man a jacket ASAP. Chilled to the bone. As food is beginning to run low, you decide to scout out the surrounding area. While walking inland in the strangely bright whiteness of the snow, you find a seven inch long fragment of bone. There's a small crack wide enough to fit a knife into along the center of the bone. You sense it may be useful in some way, but which of these choices would be most helpful? A, split the bone down the crack into two knives for self-defense. B, attach the bone to your hood and look through the crack, sporting it as stylish eyewear. Or C, hollow the bone out and make some holes in it, turning it into a flute. While the flute could certainly raise morale, the crack in its side would stop it from working. So unless you enjoy symphonies that sound like someone blowing out candles, you're out of luck. As for the knives, there are no animals that pose any real threat in Antarctica, save for seals on the coast, and you're heading inland. The seemingly silly eyewear, on the other hand, will offer you protection from a serious problem. Snow blindness. The mentioned sun's light reflects strongly off the snow and ice in Antarctica and can burn your retinas, blinding you for a while. Wearing makeshift Inuit-style sunglasses will reduce the amount of glare and sunlight entering your eyes, reducing the blinding effects. Shack of Salvation. You reach a huge frozen lake with water and fish visible 30 inches below the surface. Those fish could keep your camp fed if you could only get to them. On the side of the lake, you find an old shack, empty, save for a fishing rod, bait, and three items. Which of the items will be most useful for allowing you to catch some fish? A, a long metal pole with a handle and a spiral blade running up it. B, a rubber mallet. Or C, a lighter and a deodorant can. The rubber mallet would be virtually useless for smashing your way through ice and would only waste time and energy. The lighter and deodorant can could certainly produce a sizable flame, but it would be time consuming and would almost certainly run out before you manage to burn through 30 inches of solid ice. That leaves the bladed pole, which is formerly known as an auger. These devices can be rotated into the ice, digging through while automatically raising the ice out of the hole. With the resulting cylindrical gap, you can fish to your heart's content. Just keep the auger nearby in case the hole freezes up again. Cautious crossing. Arms laden with fish, you return to camp. After a feast, a crew member tells you he spotted the seemingly occupied base a few dozen miles northeast. You and two others head out to seek rescue. Along the way, you come across a huge ice field with three distinct dangerous paths. Severe storm winds are already rolling in and will soon get worse, so you need to move forward immediately. Which path holds your best chance of surviving a crossing? A, white, slippery ice riddled with huge cracks that drop into the abyss. B, chunks of ice floating on a wide stretch of water that, with a little bit of jumping and dexterity, could form a path. Or C, smooth surface, dark gray ice. Dark gray or black ice usually means it has only recently frozen over or is at least partially comprised of dirty slush. That means even if it's solid, there's a high chance you'll fall through into deadly waters below. The chunks of ice may seem like a semi-viable path now, but with those storm winds blowing, the chunks could easily move, leaving you stranded in the middle of the water. As for the cracked ice, as long as you're careful and watch out for the other crevices hidden under the snow, it's your best bet of making it safely across. 
going down. With merely 10 miles to the base, disaster strikes. You fall 20 feet down a concealed snow-covered crevice into a narrow ice cave with sheer slippery walls. Luckily, the snow-covered floor breaks your fall and you're not injured. But with temperatures quickly dropping into the 40s, what do you do? A, send your crew members on the six hour round trip for ropes while you sit and wait. B, try to jump up the sheer vertical walls attempting to grab the outreached hands of your crewmen. Or C, tell your crew to go on while you venture further into the dark cave, risking falling down more unseen crevices. Jumping up the walls is a no-go. Even the high jump world record of around eight feet wouldn't reach high enough, and you're not going to be breaking any records after several days in Antarctic weather. Sending the crew off is out too. Sitting in an ice cave for six hours is a sure way to freeze to death, especially with plummeting temperatures. Venturing on is the only choice that offers any hope of a positive outcome, though it's still extremely risky. Road to Rescue by some miracle, the cave emerges above ground beside an insulated shack with a snowmobile inside. There's even a can of gasoline in there. You fuel up the vehicle and head out northeast towards the base, weaving between crevices like a pro. But with rescue in sight, a blizzard hits and it's a total whiteout. You can barely see your hand in front of your face and it's at least negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you A, ride on? After all, you're so close now. B, stop, leave the engine on, burning fuel, and remain on the snowmobile. Or C, stop, turn the engine off, and pace around the snowmobile. Riding on is too risky. Falling down another crevice at high speed would swiftly end your journey and probably your life. While pacing around is a good idea to keep warm, the snowmobile could be out of action by the time the blizzard passes if you turn it off. Gasoline's freezing point varies, but in the narrow fuel lines of a vehicle, it's known to freeze even in temperatures as relatively warm as 5 degrees Fahrenheit. At negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it's simply too high of a risk. Leaving the engine on may seem wasteful, but better to have a little less fuel and get a little further, faster, than having no snowmobile at all. Plus, it'll keep you warm. When the blizzard finally passes, you finish the final stretch to the base. The inhabitants are hesitant to help you at first, but you trade your stylish bone sunglasses with them and they let you use their helicopter. You rescue your crew and eventually make your way back home to civilization. For your next adventure, you're thinking somewhere warm. Maybe a desert island. Yeah, that'll be nice. How many of these chilly survival riddles did you get right? Would you brave a real life visit to the coldest desert on earth? Let me know in the comments section below and thanks for watching.